like the previous chapter, the chapter we're going to look at this morning begins with the very same statement that Israel didn't have a king. And that's more than letting us know that our story took place before Saul and the kings who followed later in Jewish history. It's actually explaining to us a cause behind Israel's apostasy. It explains somewhat what the German atheist named Friedrich Nietzsche meant when he wrote, if God is dead, then everything is permitted. The way that God put it, everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. So what we're going to read this morning is so disgusting that most pastors have never preached from it. I myself, in 60 years of going to church, I have never heard a sermon preached from a pulpit from Judges chapter 19 or chapter 20 or chapter 21. And many biblical scholars even avoid discussing this chapter, let alone writing anything. Some of my favorite scholars skip over Judges chapter 19 and 20 and 21, saying it is so disgusting, nothing good can come from it. However, the Bible says something very different. So turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. It was our responsive reading this morning, but it's good to read it again to remind ourselves as we begin this message. And I'll start reading with verse number 15 through 17. From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. The scriptures don't save you. Jesus saves you. But it's the Scriptures that give you the information. It's the tool that the Holy Spirit uses to bring salvation, which comes through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, that means from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation, all scripture is given by inspiration, by the breathing out of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, mature, grown up, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Taking this into consideration, to skip Judges chapter 19, because it will offend our sensibilities, defies the inspiration or the breathing out of Scripture by God. And it discards the depth of man's depravity, and it destroys that picture of the dastardly nature of man's fallenness, of our sinfulness, and it would deny the grace of God. So we're not going to pass over Judges chapter 19. We're not going to pass by anything in God's word just because it makes our skin crawl. And maybe that's why the Holy Spirit even included it in Scripture. You're in 2 Timothy. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse number 1, but our focus is going to be a few verses down. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and you understand he's speaking of Old Testament Israel, verse 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now here's the part to pay attention to. Now these things, the things of the Old Testament, became our examples to the intent or for the purpose that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to play. Nor, verse 8, let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ or test him as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
All these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So Paul says that all these things of the Old Testament story of Israel were written for some special purposes, special reasons, not just there to entertain little children in Sunday school or to turn into movies. They became our examples, verse number six. Israel lusted after things that they shouldn't have. Verse number seven, it's written so that we don't become idolaters, just like the Israelites. Verse number eight, it's written so we don't commit sexual immorality, just like Israel did. Verse number nine, these things of the Old Testament are recorded so that we don't test Christ. Verse number 10, they're written so that we don't complain. Instead, we give thanks to the Lord. They happened as examples, verse number 11, for our admonition, our encouragement, our direction in life. So we need to be careful. If we think we stand, we can easily fall. What we can learn here from 1 Corinthians 10 is that when evil is not countered with the word of God, that evil will spread and it will be accepted and soon it will become celebrated. We've seen that very course happen here in the United States as well as other countries in the world. People then begin to think that that evil is normal and then they begin to celebrate it. Church, Judges chapter 19 is as significant and it is as valuable to you and to your spiritual growth as Psalm 23 and John 3.16. If all scripture is valuable because it came from the mouth of God, then what we're going to read in just a moment is as important and valuable as those verses that you love to hear and cling to. Now, before entering Canaan, God gave Israel instruction regarding the day that he would give them a king. And there were two qualifications that God set for every king of Israel. You find this in Deuteronomy chapter number 17. The qualifications were, one, the king had to be chosen by the Lord himself. And the second thing was that the king had to be Jewish. He had to be a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then God laid out three commandments regarding the trust of the king. The first thing was that the king was responsible for not accumulating horses. Horses were weapons of war in the ancient world. They weren't there to pull your little buggy or ride on in a rodeo. They were there to fight. So the king was not permitted to accumulate horses. He was to trust in God. As the psalmist said, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the Lord our God. The king also was not to accumulate wives. The accumulation of wives was a sign of a man's wealth and power. Well, the king was not to put his trust in his wealth or in the way he was perceived by his people, he was to trust in God. And that leads into the third, he was not to accumulate wealth for himself. He was there to serve God and to serve the people. There was one important cause that the king was to be 100% behind. And in Deuteronomy 17, we read that the king was also to copy, to read, to teach, and to obey the scriptures. And if he knew the scripture, he would know what the heart and the will of God was so that he could lead his people in godliness. Now, Judges chapter 19 is going to begin by reminding us that everyone is going to live and act by his own standard. There was no common standard of right or wrong in Israel. There was no what we might today call values or morality. And there was also no common leader. There was no king. And there was no common God. There was no unified religion. Those are three things that are necessary for every culture, for every nation to be stable. 
If a nation is going to be strong, they need to have a strong faith in the God of Scripture. They need to have a common leader who is strong, and they need to have a common sense of right from wrong. And Israel lacked all three of those things. And the writer of Judges is, when he says to us that Israel had no king, he is looking forward to the day when God would provide a king to lead the people in godliness and to punish evil. And you know that is still God's purpose in leaders today? Leaders matter. Leadership matters. Judges chapter 19. I'm going to read beginning in verse number 1. We'll go through verse 21. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But his concubine played the harlot against him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and she was there four whole months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly. The word literally there kindly means to speak to her heart. He wanted to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. So they sat down, and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night. Let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, and so he lodged there again. Verse 8. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, but the young woman's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. Verse 9. When the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward an evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here so that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so you may get home. However, the man was not willing to spend that night. So he rose and departed and came to opposite Jabus, that is Jerusalem. With him were the two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. Verse 11. They were near Jabus, and the day was far spent, and the servant said to his master, Come, please, let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So he said to his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed by and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. Verse 15. They turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Just then, an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of that place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going, and where do you come from? So he said to him, We're passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I am going to the house of the Lord. But there is no one who will take me into his house. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys, and bread and wine for myself 
for your female servant and for the young man who is with your servant. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he brought him into the house and gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet and they ate and drank. Verse 22. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, wicked men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we may know him carnally. We won't get to verse number 22, but this gives you some idea of the direction of the story and of this chapter. Only God has the right to command his creation on how to think and how to act and what to believe and how we are to live. And when we replace the creator, we have only each of the earth's nine billion different people to put forth their own views of life, the meaning of life and what is right and what is wrong. The Pharisees, for example, they looked very righteous, but Jesus revealed that looks can be very deceiving. Let me pause at this point and issue a reminder to all of us. Just because something is recorded in the Bible does not mean that God approves of it or that God is wanting us to repeat it or mimic it. The Bible records both the sins of men as well as the righteous acts of his saints. So we know what God desires. We know what he commands. And we know how man responds. And we can't whitewash history or we can't erase history because it's something that we want or because it's something we disagree with. The very first verse of this chapter reminds us, there was a certain Levite who was sojourning in the remote mountains of Ephraim, and he took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Here again, we have a Levite who is not living where he's supposed to be living. Numbers chapter 35, Joshua chapter 21 say that God gave the Levites specific cities or towns in which they were to live. Levitical cities, they were to stay in those cities to live. And this is a man clearly living outside of the word and the will of God. Now the Levites, if you recall from our study in chapter 17, were given specific tasks by God to perform for Israel. They were required to be the teachers of the scripture, carry the ark and its furniture when the ark was moved from place to place. They were responsible for caring for the physical needs of the tabernacle as well as the priests. This man was not doing anything that God had told him to do. We also find that he took a concubine Concubines are described for us in Exodus chapter 21 and Deuteronomy chapter 21. Generally speaking, he would take a second wife if his first wife was unable to provide him with a male child. They also were symbols of a man's wealth. The more wives you had revealed the more wealth that you had in society because only a rich man could afford more than one wife. So while the law of Moses set rules about having a concubine, God did not want and he did not promote having concubines. Why then, if God doesn't want concubines, does the law give rules about taking care of concubines? It's a very good question. Let me give you a reason from Jesus' own mouth. God's intention was for marriage to be between a man and a woman for a lifetime. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse number eight, that Moses permitted divorce because of the hardness of man's heart. Sin destroys relationships. The hardness of man's heart is why God permitted Moses to allow divorce in Israel. God didn't promote divorce. God didn't want divorce. He didn't intend divorce, but it was a result of sin 
And God says, if it's going to happen, here are some rules to govern it. Well, it's the same thing with concubines. A man having more than one wife was never God's intent for mankind. But sin corrupted everything on earth. It's the New Testament that restored God's intention for marriage. And in the New Testament, places like in Matthew 19 or 1 Corinthians 7, having a concubine is forbidden. The New Testament is not written for men with hard hearts. It's written for men whose hearts have been made new by the gospel of Jesus. A man today is to have only one wife, and a woman is to have only one husband. So this Levite was unfaithful to his first wife, and his concubine, we learn, was unfaithful to her husband as well. Religious apostasy is rampant in Israel, and apostasy in spiritual things will always result in moral depravity. Israel was experiencing the profound and gracious love of God throughout her history. And yet we read here in Judges that Israel wasn't a nation of love or fidelity in marriage or spiritual things. And contrary to the law of Moses, Jewish women were generally considered to be nothing more than property. A society that rejects God's standard and his definition of love and his definition and standard for marriage will take and elevate sex and sexual confusion will result. That's how sin and Satan work, by creating a counterfeit to God's standard. This concubine goes back to her father's house. It took four months before the Levite finally decided to get her back. It says that he went to speak kindly to her. He was going to try to convince her to speak to her heart so that she would come home with him. And notice that Bethlehem is mentioned three times in this chapter that we just read. It's mentioned also three times in chapter 17. Bethlehem is becoming an important city in our story through the book of Judges. It's preparing us for the book of Ruth, also for the king whom God was going to choose, David and Jesus. So the concubine's father was glad to meet his son-in-law, welcome him into his home. He was so happy, he says, let's celebrate this reunion. And the two men appear to get along pretty well, like they're the best of friends. At the same time, did you notice that the woman disappears from the story? And the Levite tried to go home a couple of times with his wife. And each time that he tried to leave, his father-in-law convinced him to stay for another day. Verse number nine says, after five days, the Levite got up to leave again early in the morning. And his father-in-law tried to get him to stay once again. The title of this message is The Laughing Levite. Now, the reason that I call him the Laughing Levite is because these guys were getting drunk every day. And there was probably a lot of other conversation and silliness going on in that household. Verse number nine, the man stood to depart and his concubine and the servant and his father-in-law, the young woman's father, says, look, it's the Hebrew word hina, which we've seen elsewhere translated in English as behold. It's that word that expresses surprise. It's insisting that the reader sit up, pay attention, because something important is being said here. There's something in the story you need to take notice of. That word behold is used for the very first time in the scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 29. And God said, see I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. You have this Hebrew word hinna twice there in those three verses. The first time, verse number 21, and God said, see, it's that word behold, sit up, pay attention, take notice of this. 
God says, I've given every green thing on the earth, both tree and plant, for you to eat. And then it's recorded again in verse 31, where God saw everything, and he said, indeed, it was very good. That word indeed, again, is that Hebrew word, behold, wake up, pay attention. Everything that God made was good, whether it was fruit off of a tree or a vegetable growing out of the ground, that was man's intended food. The second thing to note, pay attention to, is God says, everything that I've made is good. Back in our story in Judges chapter 19, by the afternoon, the Levite had had enough. And the Levite says, it's getting late in the day. We have got to get back to our business, back to our lives. We've got to go. And folks, you know how that is. You ever been with people and you hate to have to leave? This dad doesn't want the son-in-law to leave. The Levite finally pries himself and his concubine and his servant out of the house and back on the road. While everybody is doing that which seems right in their own eyes, that made traveling something that was not safe in the time of the judges. They're about five miles from Bethlehem. The Levite servant says, let's stop for the night in the city of Jabus before the darkness falls completely. We had friends who lived in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Wayne and Nita had a home in uh, Southern California. For decades, they would drive from Southern California to Puerto Vallarta between their two homes. And they continued to do that until about the year 2010, when the drug cartels took over the Mexican highways. And the drug cartels were robbing every vehicle, whether it was private or even military, and killing everybody in the cars. Unsafe to drive in Mexico. Unsafe to walk on the road to Bethlehem. The city of Jabus was known by two other names. It's also called in the book of Genesis, the city of Salem. In Hebrew, the word Salem is Shalom or Shalom, which means peace. Jabus, however, means to trample under one's foot. And Jabus was a Canaanite city until David conquered it. When David conquered the stronghold at Jabus, he changed the name of the city to Jerusalem, the city of peace. Now this Levite, as the sun is beginning to set, says we're not staying in Jabus. He calls it a city of foreigners. It's a place where Jews don't live and Jews don't go. A Jew couldn't be safe in the city of non-Jews. So he says, let's continue on down the road. Let's go to the closest Jewish city, the city of Gibeah. Now, many years later, the city of Gibeah would become important in Scripture because it happens to be the birthplace of King Saul. Gibeah also was the first capital city of the kingdom of Israel. When the party finally gets to Gibeah, they were not met like they expected to be met. The people of Gibeah refused to take the Levite and his party in for the night. Now today, when you and I are traveling, we can stop for the night, we can eat at a restaurant, then we can sleep in a nice motel. Well, that's not how things were done in the ancient world. It might surprise you that the first hotel where travelers could stop and pay for a place to sleep for the night didn't exist until the 700s AD. The first hotels were invented by the Japanese. By the 1600s, that idea of a hotel spread to Europe. And the first modern hotel wasn't invented until the 1800s in England. The Romans had a word in Latin. It was the word hospice. The word meant a person who served as a host, someone who entertained another person. In the mid-1300s, the French took that word hospice and they created the French word hôpital. The word hôpital means literally shelter. The word we use today, hospital, comes from that French word. A hospital originally was a place you went when you were tired and wanted to sleep. 
It wasn't until the year 1540 that the English word hospital became a place for sick people to go. And our English word hotel, a place where you stay for the night that is hosted, goes back to that Latin word hospice. Before the creation of hotels, you had slept outside under a tree, or maybe in someone's stall, you would stay with family, or you would find a stranger who would take you into their home for the night. We have to remember, before the invention of the modern automobile, most people never traveled outside their home. People didn't take vacations unless you were extremely wealthy. Now, the ancient world was full of all kinds of stories, tales about gods who came and visited the earth. And in one of those stories, there was a king named Acrisius in the city of Delphi. King Acrisius was warned by a prophetess that his beautiful daughter, Danae, would give birth to a son, and Danae's son would murder Acrisius. Acrisius took and imprisoned his daughter in a bronze tower. You know the story of Rapunzel? It actually comes from ancient Greece. Now, the tower had no doors and had no windows, so that no man could ever get into the tower and get hold of Danae and make her pregnant. However, one night, the chief god of the Greeks, Zeus, found out how beautiful Danae was. And so he decided he was going to go and visit her. Rather than come in human form, he came to her in the form of rain. The rain streamed down through the roof and streamed down into the room where Danae was sleeping, and the rain went into her body and impregnated her. And soon she gave birth to the half-god, half-man by the name of Perseus. And Perseus ended up killing King Acrisius. Now you're saying, well, why are you telling me this? Greeks and Romans, because of that story, feared the gods. The gods were not loving and gracious. The gods would fly off the handle at anything, and anything they wanted, they would just take. Anything they wanted to do, they would just do it, because the gods cared only about themselves. And so if you worship the gods of Greece or of Rome, you feared them. The gods could appear at any time, any place, in any form, and they could appear for any purpose. Greek and Roman gods never appeared to do anything for good. So when the gods came, it was always to the detriment of the worshipers. How different that is from the God of the Bible. So Greeks and Romans feared taking strangers into their homes. That stranger might be Zeus, who decides he wants to come and toy with people. Or one of the other gods, who knows what they might be up to. They could be very vengeful, so you never welcome a stranger. Hospitality was against Greek and Roman culture. They did have ancient, what they called, inns. Inns were well known to be very expensive, dirty, places of violence and immorality. The idea of going to a Greek or Roman inn at the day was like going to a brothel. As the gospel of Jesus penetrated the Greek and Roman world, apostles, missionaries began traveling through the Greco-Roman world. And as they traveled, they needed safe places to stay, places they could go to have other basic needs met. And in Romans chapter 12, verse number 13, we have an interesting command that every Christian is to be, quote, given to hospitality, to being hospitable. So important was that characteristic that in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, it's given as a qualification to be a pastor, and you are commanded to do the same. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody knocks on the door and says, hey, Marion, you don't know me, but I was just walking down the street and I saw that rose bush outside your house. I thought you should give me dinner, put me a, give me a good bed to sleep in for the next three months. When the scripture's talking about strangers, really it's talking about strangers that you may be familiar with. We're talking about a visiting pastor or an evangelist. It's not talking about every Tom and Dick and Harry. 
that would be dangerous to you and your family. A lot of strangers are not coming because they need a place to sleep or a meal. They're coming because they want to see what you've got so they can take it. God is not commanding that we open ourselves up to violence. So don't get the wrong idea about hospitality. We're talking about, say, an evangelist or a pastor comes to the church, take him out for dinner. If he needs a place to sleep, get him a hotel room or bring him into your house if you feel comfortable with that and he feels comfortable with that. One of my favorite preachers used to hate visiting other churches because people would invite him to come and stay in their house. He'd say, thank you so much, but I don't want to stay in your house. I want to be in a hotel room where I can pray, where I can have time for myself. Because if I come and stay at your house, you're going to keep me up all night wanting to talk. I need sleep. I need rest. All right. And very often that's the case. So it doesn't mean you got to bring them into your house, but make sure they are comfortable wherever they are staying. That would be a modern hospitality. That biblical word hospitality literally means to show care, to offer kindness by welcoming someone you don't know personally. And hospitality took an active interest in making that stranger feel comfortable, to be aware of them and their needs so that those needs could be met. Today, we don't worry about entertaining fickle gods who want to come and make our virgin daughters pregnant. We have hundreds and thousands of luxurious hotel rooms with free laundry service, food with transportation. They dot our cities, big and small. And Christian hospitality may not be necessary like it was 2,000 years ago, but kindness still is. Friendliness definitely is needed. Care must be given. On Sunday morning when we gather to worship, you see a visitor? Go introduce yourself to that person. Ask if you could sit with them or they might want to sit with you. Do you know what it's like to walk into a church the first time and be all alone and not have anyone even speak to you? I see you don't have a Bible. You want to share my Bible? And you know, most strangers that walk in the door don't know where to even turn in a Bible to find anything. So they sit back there with a Bible and they've got no idea where the book of Judges is. Sit with them, help them. Hold your Bible out and say, hey, follow along with me. If you're available, take them out for dinner. Get to know them. That is hospitality, and you are commanded by God to be hospitable. I know it's uncomfortable to see strangers. It can even be scary. But remember, you're a stranger too sometimes. And how would you want to be treated as a stranger? The Levite in our story, he expected somebody in a Jewish town to welcome another Jew, especially a Levite. He thought somebody in Gibeah would take him and his party in for the night. Verse 15 literally reads that the Levite went into the town square. He sat down and no one even spoke to him. And in Israel, that concept of hospitality was very important. Feeding and giving shelter to a stranger was a cultural kindness common throughout the Middle East at the time. You find it in the Bible as early as Genesis chapter 18. Abraham is sitting in his tent and he sees three strangers coming down the road. He goes and brings them into his personal tent and then spends the day cooking food for them. The Levite should have known there was something amiss in Gibeah. Verse 16 uses the words, just then. Just then an old man walked by. That word just then is the Hebrew word hina. Behold, pay attention, take notice, something important is happening here. An old man is returning after working all day out in the field. It's already dark. And like the Levite, the old man was also from Ephraim in the mountains. And the old man was living temporarily in the city of Gibeah. 
And he had a pretty good idea of what the people of Gibeah were really like. It was the outsider in Gibeah who showed kindness to the stranger in Gibeah. The old man takes them into his house. He washed their dirty feet. He fed them. And then he went outside and he fed and watered the Levites' animals. Everything was going great in the old man's house. Everybody was happy. They were having a good time getting to know each other until there was a ruckus outside the old man's house on the street. Our text tells us in verse number 22, perverted men, literally it's wicked men or men of bad repute, they surrounded the house and they beat on the door. And they spoke to the master of the house. That old man said, bring out the man who came to your house. Now, who all was in the house? Well, we know it's the old man, the Levite. The Levite's concubine is, and we know that he has at least one servant with him. So there are at least four people in that house, three men and one woman. Bring out the man that we may know him. If you have a New King James Version, you'll see that the word carnally is in italics. The letters are slanted. That means it's not in the original Hebrew text. That means that word carnally has been added so that we understand the meaning better. That word that we may know him, the word refers to sexuality. Bring out the Levite so we can rape him. They demanded that the Levite be surrendered to them for homosexual acts. The writer of this story of the book of Judges wants us to see that life in Israel was just as bad or worse than the life in the Canaanite cities. The writer of our story is comparing the Jewish city of Gibeah to Sodom and Gomorrah. Only Gibeah is worse because the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites were not God's chosen people. What does it say when the people of God are just as evil and wicked or more so than the unsaved around them? We're gonna stop the story right here until next time because the story gets worse. Pastor, you started by telling us that all scripture is breathed out by God and it's good for us. What in the world is good for us here? What can help us in our walk with Jesus from this? Well, one is the command we're to be hospitable. But last week I said that we should expect insanity from an insane world, and sin has made our world insane. As Christian people, we should rejoice at what the Supreme Court ruled this last week. Roe versus Wade was never a law. It was a decision made by nine people sitting in black robes. It was never the law of the land. It was a court decision. Laws are made by the legislature, by the Congress. And we should be rejoicing that that ruling by the Supreme Court from 1973 was overturned. If we're not gonna stand up for the unborn, how can we expect anybody else to? The scripture is full of examples of the unborn being alive, being conscious. The prophet Jeremiah, God chose him from conception to be his servant. How about John the Baptist? When John the Baptist was in his mother's womb and Mary walked in with Jesus in her womb, the scripture says that the baby jumped for joy in her womb when Jesus walked in. And are you telling me that Jesus, when he was in Mary's womb, was not conscious, was not living, was not a human being? That Jesus didn't become a human being until he was pushed out of the birth canal? How dare people who call themselves Christians say that the unborn is not human and is not worthy of being protected there in the womb? If there's any place in this world where somebody should be safe, it should be in their mother's womb. And yet I've read Christian after Christian after Christian in name lamenting the fact that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. They're upset. Even worse are the pastors who have been silent. God loves them just as much as he loves you outside the womb. This world is insane. 
And how dare people call on the name of God and Jesus as their savior and live and accept and practice the insanity of the unregenerate. Israel should have been living in a way that honored their divine deliverer. You know, the Christian life isn't easy. Every one of us experienced that battle between the old sin nature and that new nature that God implants within us, that new birth. If anybody should be living a sane life, a life that honors Christ, a life that denies sin, it must be us. And yet I see unsaved people living better lives than some people who call on the name of Jesus as their savior. And this Christ-like life isn't by our efforts to keep rules or by trying harder, attempting to obey God. We are saved by the grace of God, so we must also live by the grace of God. We're saved by God's gift of faith. We must then walk by his gift of faith. So what can we glean for our spiritual walk from what we've read here in Judges chapter 19? We should be living better lives than the unsaved people around us, but it is hard. But Paul gave us a great explanation in his letter to the Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, and he gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. The Christian life can't be lived any other way that pleases God unless it's lived by God's grace through God's gift of faith in God's Son, Jesus.